section four, and it's just called 19th Century Progress. I'd like to talk about some of the really exciting breakthroughs in science and technology that have, have really made a big change in, in the way that we live and in the type of entertainment that we consume. So lots of fun stuff, I hope, uh, as we get through this. So. Let's look at the first light bulb. Now, the clip that you're watching when the bulb is, connected to is a zoomed in version of a light bulb turning on and watch it very carefully. It's getting hotter. You can even see the arc of electricity and then boom, it burst. Now the question is, what caused it to burst? Too much energy. Yeah, and, and this was the main question that Thomas Edison had to figure out. You see, everybody knew that heat generates light. Yeah, it doesn't take a rocket scientist or inventor to figure that out. Everybody knows that. But the really tricky part is how can you harness that in a sustainable way. Because, okay, heat generates light. That's fire. What does fire do? It destroys. Well, that doesn't work in a light bulb. Okay, so heated metal generates light. Woohoo! What does that do? Well, if you bend a paper clip enough, it will heat up, yes, and soon after it will break. Why? Because when you heat and cool, heat and cool, heat and cool metal, it becomes brittle and breaks. So the question is, is there a type of metal that you can heat and cool, heat and cool, heat and cool that won't break? Now, Thomas Edison once said, in addition to figuring out the light bulb, I figured out thousands of ways not to make the light bulb. He just applied the scientific process. His and, and, and you guys are learning about the scientific method, you start with a problem. Problem is, I want to make a light bulb. And then you formulate a hypothesis. Let's try steel. And then you perform the experiment. Steel heats up over time, becomes brittle and breaks. And then you document your observed results. And then you write your conclusions of your findings. And then guess what? That's just one piece. It doesn't mean it's a failure. It just means you found a way not to make a light bulb. Repeat that process a thousand times or more, and eventually Thomas Edison discovered that, yeah, tungsten can be heated and cooled, heated and cooled, heated and cooled. And you know what? It's our light bulbs. Granted, these are fluorescent, so they use a different system, but same idea. Next one I want to show you is the telephone. Alexander Graham Bell in 1876 invented the telephone. And in this little informative looped video that I've got for you, we're going to see how it works. Now this is quite incredible. You see, decades prior, I believe it was 1832, Samuel F.P. Morris, an American inventor, had developed the telegraph what he was able to observe was that electricity transmitted over copper wire generated a sound and that you could control that sound by controlling the fl flow of electricity along that car copper wire and so if you stop the flow using a pattern you can send communications over long distances instantly ergo the telegraph Alexander Graham Bell improved on the technology with the telephone by using the sound of a person's voice and translating that into a current which could then be translated back into a sound on the other side of the line. And this ability to send sound waves over long distances not only became the telephone which has obviously changed our lives but it also of same technology was applied to the radio and how you can broadcast information 
even without wires. You can send it electronically through the airwaves. And the next one I want to talk about, the automobile. When the internal combustion engine was developed, it was a major improvement on the steam engine. Instead of having to maintain a massive fire to heat up water, to be contained in a highly pressurized chamber to provide propulsion, all of that can be shrunk down. And instead of coal, gasoline can be used to generate not slow contained pressure with steam, but small burst of explosions. And this engine can be small enough to put into vehicles and later airplanes. And Henry Ford did not invent the automobile, but he developed a method to make this cheap. He made the automobile cheap. Whereas in the 1880s, the first ones were only for the extremely wealthy. Because of Henry Ford, everyone could afford an automobile because of his famous assembly line techniques. Now, as I said, the Wright brothers took this technology and improved upon it. There had been a long-standing bet for many years, ever since the development of the internal combustion engine, that somebody could put one of these on a plane and fly. But the big problem that no one could quite figure out is how do you make an engine lightweight enough that it can be placed onto a plane and provide forward propulsion without weighing down the glider and causing it to crash. Many had tried, all had failed, until these two bicycle mechanics from Ohio developed the technology for a small enough engine that could be attached to the wings of a plane. They decided to, of course, demonstrate their technology and test their theory in the sand dunes in North Carolina. And they were able to generate flight Granted, for less than 20 seconds, but it was enough to win the bet, and within 10 years, people were flying across countries on this technology that the Wright brothers had developed. The next one is another major one. You see, Louis Pasteur, with the pasteurization process, demonstrated that back bacteria not only existed, you see, once upon a time, people died of the plague because we didn't know what to call it. It was a mysterious entity that killed many. Nothing could be done about it, really, and then it would, over time, disappear. But Pasteur was able to prove that many diseases are caused, in fact, by bacteria. And that we can kill this bacteria in the food that we eat. He was focused, in particular, on milk. Now, when you milk a cow, that's called unpasteurized milk. It's just straight out of the cow. You can drink it, okay. You probably shouldn't drink it. The main reason is, when you drink it straight from the cow, you are getting every bacteria that is contained in the cow. Cows eat some gross stuff, guys. When well, they're just wandering around in the pasture, what are they eating? They might be eating poop. I mean, my dog eats poop. They might be eating poop. They might be drinking out of a stream that all of the cow waste runs off into. So they might be drinking out of a nasty body of water. Bottom line, you shouldn't eat raw beef. You also shouldn't drink unpasteurized milk. When he developed the process of pasteurization, very simple, it just used heat to kill bacteria. It's the same reason why if you go camping, don't drink out of the stream. Don't drink the untreated water. Now you can filter the water, okay. You can put iodine in the water, you can treat it to kill many things, but the only way to truly be safe is to boil it. That will kill everything. And so Pasteur developed the process 
Very simple, apply heat to milk, boom, it's pasteurized. And so now the milk that you buy in the grocery store has been pasteurized and now is free of that bacteria. Jenner neither knew why his vaccine worked, nor did he know exactly what caused smallpox in the first place. The unknown world of microbes had yet to be discovered. It was not explored until 50 years later by Louis Pasteur in Paris. This French chemist made some of the most significant discoveries in the history of medicine. Even today, the Pasteur Institute is one of the top addresses for research into infectious disease and the development of new medications to combat the flu, dangerous tropical diseases, and AIDS. It all started in 1856 with a research assignment from the French alcohol industry. Time and again, the fermenting beetroot solution failed to produce the desired alcohol, but instead turned into a cloudy acidic liquid. A souring experience for both the taste buds and the bank book. Pasteur takes samples to ascertain what might be the cause. At that time, lighted microscopes capable of magnifying specimens up to 1,000 times were allowing people a closer look at the world's microcosmos. Looking through the microscope, Pasteur discovers that yeast can ferment beetroot juice to form alcohol, while bacteria make it undrinkable. The sample was teeming with microscopic creatures, bacteria in a variety of forms. Pasteur is able to prove that germs come from the air and spread throughout the fermenting liquid. Pasteur also discovers that he could prevent milk from spoiling by heating it and killing the bacteria in it. Heating a product enough to kill bacteria while preserving flavor is dubbed pasteurization in his honor. The research assignment gives him an ingenious idea. If bacteria cause the sickness of alcohol, can they also make people sick? If we identify these bacteria, we might be able to find a way to fight them. Every year, thousands of people die after being bitten by rabid dogs. In 1880, Pasteur searches for the pathogen that causes rabies. He searches in vain, since it's a virus that is infinitely smaller than a bacterium. Rabid dogs first snap wildly in all directions, then become lethargic and excrete large quantities of saliva, before finally dying a miserable death. A bite turns man's best friend into his worst enemy. The rabies viruses creep slowly through the nerve tracts of the spinal cord until they reach the brain. In humans, they also bring about excruciatingly painful seizures. People suffering from rabies can no longer swallow and they end up dying of thirst. In 1885, nine-year-old Joseph Meister is brought to Pasteur. A rabid dog has bitten him 14 times. Death is inevitable. Pasteur faces a difficult decision. He has been able to develop a vaccine from the spinal cords of rabid rabbits and has been successful using this vaccine on animals. But will it work on a human? He dares to try it out. Joseph Meister is brought back from death's door, cured of rabies. The rabies vaccination is a worldwide sensation. Among the many desperate people seeking Pasteur's help are 19 Russians from Smolensk. He is able to save the lives of almost all of them with his serum. Proudly, Pasteur reports his findings to the Academy of Sciences. Of 1,700 infected, only 10 died because they were treated too late. Today, a statue still commemorates the first vaccination against rabies, a historic moment in medicine.
a child gets a little scratch while frolicking with the dog. Today, this is no longer a reason for parents to worry. Did you know? Rudimentary microscopes had been around for centuries, but they were not used in medical research until the mid-19th century. Physicians first used these instruments to study blood for characteristics of anemia and urine for evidence of infection. Doctors also felt the presence of a microscope in their offices looked good and inspired patients' confidence in their abilities. In the late 1800s, Mendeleev organized a periodic table with the elements by increasing atomic mass and placed elements in columns based on similar properties. When elements that fit the pattern weren't available, Mendeleev left gaps in the table. For example, he left a spot below Si or silicon for an element that hadn't been discovered yet. He predicted it would have a mass of 72, a density of 5.5, and that it would be a dark gray metal. Fifteen years later, the element germanium was discovered. This discovery, and ones like it, gave credibility to Mendeleev's periodic table. Many people avidly followed the latest discoveries in geology and astronomy. They began to realize how small their world was in relation to the universe, and that the stars and Earth predated humanity by millions of years. Until that time, the biblical version of creation had been widely accepted as fact. Now people began to ask questions. Was the universe created solely for human use? Was the universe really created in just seven days? <laughs> Was the Adam and Eve version of creation to be taken literally? Charles Darwin's theory of evolution on the origin of species, published in 1859, provided scientific evidence for questioning the biblical story of human origins. Darwin wrote a detailed study of the ways in which all forms of life evolved as they adapted to their environment. It caused a storm of discussion and debate, and from then on, tensions built between faith and certainty and scientific discovery. This all goes back to germ theory. The British surgeon Joseph Leister, uh, Ed Brooklyn was talking about this a while back, uh, noticed a trend that doctors who weren't washing their hands were performing surgeries and then their rates of infection were worse than doctors who were washing their hands. And he began to do these studies in a scientific way. And in addition to requiring that doctors wash their hands, another conclusion was that surgical instruments should be absolutely sterile. And this can be done in a number of ways. Heat to kill bacteria, you know, uh, it, important you know cleaning process when you go under surgery if you go under the knife it's a brand new knife that will be thrown away when they're done that's you know the the safest way to ensure that your tools are sterile and so not only did Joseph Leister's studies on bacteriology lead to improvements in surgery and 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 better outcomes and results um, this understanding of bacteria also led scientists to begin to study and develop vaccines that we can eradicate some diseases. We can prevent some diseases. You know, for example, when, uh, when the cure for polio was developed, the cure for polio, that's a big one. Many of us would be dead in this room had that vaccine not been developed. Now, Another important scientific theory of the late 1800s was the theory of evolution. Charles Darwin, English scientist, spent much of his time in research on the Galapagos Islands, studying the biodiversity on this island. And when he wrote his conclusions in The Origin of Species, he developed a scientific model to explain the complexity of life on the island, but as well as on the planet. And he theorized that human beings and other animals are evolved from different species and that because 
the world is in a state of natural selection, meaning that we are all in competition for survival and for reproduction, that given an infinite timeline can lead to explain the complexity of life that we have on this world. Now, in the 1880s, most people had, before Darwin's findings, had generally accepted that the earth was the process of a creation from a divine being. You know, the really fancy term, if you want to sound smart there, uh, was the teleological theory, that the complexity and the biodiversity of life pre-1980s, pre-Darwin, was generally explained by an omnipotent creator. Again, that's called the teleological theory, that that was the explanation, that was the simple explanation for the complexity of life. But Darwin's theory was earth-shattering because it answered more questions than creationism did. And I'll leave it at that. But uh, while the model works and it explains all of the different steps along the way, uh, many people still continue to challenge this. So I want to unpack it a little bit. So here's the theory of evolution. Darwin's idea is that those creatures most suitably adapted to their conditions are most likely to survive long enough to reproduce. And given an infinite timeline, those fittest specimens are most likely to generate offspring. And so the best genes will be passed to the next generation. And over millions of years, this can actually result not only in microevolution, which is small changes like how ethnic groups form, but macroevolution which is how new species can evolve and form. And this theory is that none of this happened in the blink of an eye, that it happened over a very long period of time through the process of natural selection. Now, moving on, an Austrian monk, Gregor Mendel, began to study this. And using his theory of evolution, okay, well, if the strongest aspects of a generation are passed on to the next because of natural selection, what does that mean? What are those aspects? Can they be measured? Can they be studied? And so Mendel and his work developed the entire study of genetics. You know, you know for example... Recessive and dominant tree traits were the work of Mendel. That if someone has blue eyes and their parents both have blue eyes and they marry someone with blue eyes, that might be a dominant trait and we can actually predict the likelihood that their offspring will also have blue eyes. And you can put it down to a percent based on your study of genetics. In 1803, John Dalton theorized that all matter is made up of atoms. Now think about this. This is a huge advancement from Aristotle's work. You know, for centuries, people generally accepted what Aristotle had theorized, that all life could be explained by the four basic elements, earth, air, wind, fire. And that was the explanation of all life. But John Dalton said, no, it's more complicated than that. There are elements. And these elements are made up of atoms. And atoms are the basic building block. And so a few years later, uh, Mendeleev added to this work and actually began to chart the known elements into the periodic table. 
Another major advancement into physics and chemistry were the studies of radioactivity performed by Marie and Pierre Cure. And they discovered that radium and polymenium, these two radioactive elements, produced energy on their own behalf. You know, and that part of their atomic decay was the giving off of energy. Sadly, these two scientists died from radiation exposure, but the work they left us is profound. And, and other scientists later have, have built on this work, and now thanks to the work they began, we can generate electricity based off of radiation given as these particles begin to disintegrate over a very long period of time. And then Ernest Rutherford took this a step further when he said, no atoms are not the smallest component. They are made up of parts as well, protons, neutrons, electrons, and that the electrons actually orbit the protons and neutrons. You know, and so Think of like the quantum realm, you know, so when you zoom into that smallest, like what is the smallest thing? And you begin to see, what do you see? That actually these tiny little particles resemble universes in their own right. That these protons and these neutrons actually have gravity. And of course that confirms Copernicus's work. And that the electrons orbit around these objects, just like planetary bodies in the universe. Now, social scientists began to even apply the scientific method to human behavior. What if we can predict and analyze how a person will act? And so that's where the studies of sociology and anthropology came in, and even the studies of psychology, uh, which I'm getting to teach psychology for the first time, and I'm loving it. It's a fascinating class. It's the study of human behavior, the study of the mind. And which I want to point out a few famous psychologists and sociologists. First off, we'll start with Ivan Pavlov. He believed that human actions are the result of unconscious reactions. Pavlov, and you may have heard of his famous experiment with Pavlov's dog, was able to demonstrate that we have unconscious reactions to stimuli that generate a physical response. For example, in your years of attending public school, I'm sure you've been in buildings where the bell system was implemented, and I'm sure you all spent the period before lunch thinking about, man, when do I get to eat? And I would predict that the sound of the end bell in third period made you salivate. That just the sound of that bell generated an unconscious response. And the reason I have that prediction is because Pavlov proved it. And he was able to demonstrate it in a controlled environment. That if you associate a sound with an action and if you replicate that over time, you condition that animal into a physical response. Sigmund Freud was also a groundbreaker in the world of psychology. He developed a process called psychoanalysis, or psychoanalysis, excuse me, because he believed that our unconsciousness is what drives our behavior that we are not rational beings, that we are instead controlled by our unconscious, and it affects who we are. Again, his emphasis on the fact that we are not rational creatures. We do not always do what makes sense, but that can be analyzed, that can be broken down. Behavioral Behavioral psychologists have come up with new views, not only of animal behavior, but of human nature as well. And these views all concern a process that we take for granted. 
learning because we are all truly born to learn. Ironically, one of the most important figures in the study of learning, Ivan Pavlov, wasn't concerned with the subject at all, at least not at first. Pavlov, a noted Russian scientist, won the Nobel Prize for Physiology and Medicine in 1904. As this original footage shows, Pavlov was initially interested in digestion and the action of the salivary glands. By diverting the saliva of dogs into test tubes, he could precisely measure if and how much they salivated during digestion. When food was presented, the dog salivated quickly and inherited salivary reflex. But over repeated testings, a strange thing happened the dog salivated before contact with the food. Just the sight of the food was enough to stimulate their drooling. Then, just seeing the food dish, or even hearing the footsteps of Pavlov or his assistants, was enough to trigger this built-in reflex. What was going on to elicit this response? Pavlov decided to find out by systematically varying the stimuli and measuring the dog's reaction. Metronomes, lights, and bells were all used as stimuli, and they all worked as stand-ins for the food. What mattered was not the kind of stimulus that was used, but the fact that it reliably signaled that food was on the way. Pavlov had discovered a fundamental type of learning called classical conditioning. An original stimulus elicits an automatic, unlearned response. Both stimulus and response happen naturally. They are unconditioned. Then a second, neutral stimulus that never elicits the unconditioned response by itself is introduced just before the presentation of the original stimulus. If the neutral or signaling stimulus is presented alone, and a response occurs as if the original stimulus were still there, we say that conditioning has taken place. The arbitrary neutral stimulus becomes a conditioned stimulus. The reverse is also true. Pavlov and others studied the extinction over time of such conditioned responses. When the subject learns that the conditioned stimulus no longer signals a desired event, the acquisition process is reversed as the learned connection is gradually weakened. Pavlov's work and the work of those who followed him led to a remarkable conclusion and that is any stimulus an organism can perceive is capable of eliciting any reaction the organism is capable of making. This means that virtually any sound, sight or smell can influence the way our muscles tense or relax, our moods fluctuate, or even the way our attitudes are formed. For instance, if I say, relax, and then do this, you're going to be startled and upset. After five or six pairings of relax, just saying the word relax is going to generate a negative response rather than its usual learned reaction.
my flying flag and forever in peace may you wave. You're the emblem of the land I love, the home of the free and the brave. Every heart beats true under red, white, and blue where there's never a boat or brag. But should old acquaintance be forgotten, keep your eye on the grand old rag. Speaking of mass culture, just look at this, you know, one of the oldest video recordings in history. Obviously, it was a sporting event. Of course it was, right? Um, the Olympics were brought back in 1896, first held in Athens, Greece, in honor of the original Olympics. It drew huge crowds from all over the world to come watch the greatest athletes in the world perform. Uh, at track and field events, at uh, floor competitions, at uh, wrestling or running or um, throwing javelin or jumping. And, and people, again, were coming all over the world and were looking at some of the oldest video footage, which I just think is really cool. So, as we're thinking about mass culture, and as I'm showing you some of these earliest video recordings, in a moment, we're going to watch the oldest film in history. And I want you to actually watch it. I mean, I'm going to let you work on your stuff, do your thing, but I want you to actually watch it. It's, it's a really good movie, the oldest film in history. I'm gonna make that 